Okay, so we're going to talk about a father's perspective is uh, the title of our panel. Uh, and I'm going to introduce our panel now. So uh, first I'd like to call uh, to the stage David Bang, who has two children, including a six-year-old son, Eric, who has autism. David, you want to come up? Uh, we also have Steve Harbin, who has six children, uh, including two with autism, Jordan, who is 21, and Jacob, who is 17. And then we have uh, Matthew Hardy, who has two children, including Thomas, his 10-year-old son, who has autism. Matthew, are you coming up? Matthew, come up. Okay. Uh, and then we have Ryan Hurley, who also has two children, including his 10-year-old son, Jackson, who has autism. And uh, now I'm going to, uh, is Matthew in the house? Do we know where Matthew is? Ah, see, that, that is autism, is it not? Okay, well, hopefully Matthew will come join us after, uh, after that. If not, um, uh, we'll meet him some other time. I look forward to that. So, okay, here's my first question. So, what did you feel and think when you found out your child had autism? David, why don't you start? Okay, so I am a divorced father of two kids. Uh, so when I was married at the time, uh, when my son was uh, showing signs of autism, uh, my wife uh, and I would argue and fight all the time. I was in denial. Uh, so I was basically saying, nothing's wrong with my son, Eric. And my uh, wife at the time was saying, no, there is something wrong. You know, he's not like normal other kids. And I was still in denial, so we would have a lot of yelling matches, and I would say, no, there's nothing wrong with Eric. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it took me a while to accept my son uh, with autism. Do you uh, remember the moment that you made that transition? Uh, when he was diagnosed at the age of two, uh, clinically diagnosed with uh, autism on the spectrum, then I, yeah, I, uh, I lost it. Yeah, I just totally lost it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now, I mean, the, my son is seven years old now, but that was uh, five years ago. But I, you know, and then uh, at the time, my wife said, you know, it was okay for me to be in denial because she was also trying to be in denial herself. Uh, but, uh, but I can still remember to this day, I would just, you know, say to, he, to my ex-wife at the time, how dare you say my son is abnormal? And I was uh, really... Um, angry at that time, and I was thinking, don't say this about my son, it's not true. Uh, but then when I, you know, went through the long, rigorous uh, assessment process for the clinical diagnosis, uh, reality hit me, and I realized, uh, yes, my son is uh, different, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard journey. It's hard, you know. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, same question. Well, I, I don't want to say thank you for uh, you know letting me participate tonight, and I, I don't know if you if they really realize what they've done is they've given the microphone to three proud fathers, and you know we may get the slides out and all the things you know when we start talking <laughs> about our children uh, because we feel that way about them, but uh, we really uh, you know I you know thinking and feeling, I tell you. I, my wife reminded me of a uh, situation when we knew something was wrong. We weren't quite sure. We came up one day, and our son, two years old, had gotten out of his out of his bed, and he'd gone into our bedroom, which is upstairs, and he had t up, raised the window and thrown everything out the window that he that wasn't fastened down, including the alarm clock and the lamp, and it was hanging by that. And he had taken all his clothes off, and he was standing totally naked on the nightstand, urinating. And we thought, this is not normal. Uh, something's probably we need to check into this maybe uh, because we had raised five other children and yes they had their peculiarities and quirks but we never get quite seen anything this quirky but I do remember that's we a, that's a sign that's a sign <laughs> that, that's right that's a sign so anyway I do remember very much so uh, the exact place when I sort of the realization hit me uh, we had gotten our diagnosis the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. It took six months to get an appointment. 
and uh, we sort of knew it was coming, and I remember uh, driving up the driveway to go to our church where we were doing some training for people with ABA program that we were going to start. And I'm thinking to myself, I cannot do this. God, I cannot do this. And I just felt overwhelmed. I mean, I'm an engineer, and so I thought to myself, hey, engineers solve problems. This is a problem. Okay, what do I do? Go, go on the Internet, go anywhere I can, talk to everybody, figure out what needed to be done. And, and so that was my thought process. And let's, let's find out a way to fix the problem. It, you know, what doctor do we go to, what therapy, whatever. So, Thank you. Uh, Ryan? I'll take this one. Oh. Um, that moment, uh, Jackson's journey was a little bit different. Uh, we had just left Denver and moved to Atlanta. Jackson was two as well when he was diagnosed, and it was credit to his mother, um, my wife, and she knew something was wrong with Jackson. So being diagnosed at two, sitting in that doctor's office, it was she and I, and the tears started flowing. It was very sad, as you can imagine, uh, to hear that tough pill to swallow. Um, and it wasn't until a couple days later, um, and there was some wine involved uh, that was helping uh, cope with this, and... We sat there and we were talking through it and trying to figure out what to do. So in many kids that are autistic, you know, there's that emotion of fight or flight. And with that, it was our opportunity to fight or flight. And we decided to obviously fight and continue to do this this day. Didn't know that Jackson would still be nonverbal at 10 um, and suffer from many more things other than autism. But that moment that it's a very defining moment in our lives to hear those words, to accept that, and then take charge of your children's life. Um, it was sad. It still is. I still feel um, there's not, uh, there's moments that I still cry uh, because I feel that I, it goes back to that moment of hearing that and knowing that I still have to fight for Jackson, that, you know, Jackson may very well be with me for the rest of my life, and that's the reality, and uh, unfortunately, that's even a tougher pill to swallow, but it goes back to that moment at two, when you hear that, and it prepares you for this, and it gets you stronger, and better, and more of a fighter, and there's many more things that are out there as an individual and a parent, uh, single or not. Uh, that you can find that can help you and your children, like Autism Speaks and some other things. But again, it's that moment has changed us forever, and it forever will, and it won't ever be one thing that I'm sad about. It's I'm proud. I'm proud to be his dad. I know his mom is proud to be his mother. Um, you know, we are his voice. I hope he, I hear him one day. I, I do. I, I truly do. But that moment will always stick forever in us and in how we transition to where we are today. So hopefully uh, we're, we're going to keep fighting. Yeah. David, you have something to add? Yeah, something to add. So uh, when Ryan was talking about, you know, being protective and, you know, really having a voice for your son, the one uh, incident strikes out, which uh, when I was... Uh, married at the time, we went out as a family soon after his diagnosis, and uh, my son was, you know, he, he didn't want to go out, he was just uh, agitated, and, and then uh, my wife uh, was, you know, going to the restroom, and then she overheard some guy at the bar saying, get that kid out, he doesn't belong here, just get him out, and then my wife came back to me and said, you know, there's a guy over there who's complaining about Eric, our son, and I said, okay, I need to do something, she says, no, just just ignore him, just sit down and be quiet, just le let it go. And I couldn't let it go. So what I did was I literally got up and went towards the bar to that man, and I said, are you complaining about my son from what I heard? And he said, yes, get him out. He doesn't belong here. And then, and then I said, wait a minute. You know, for one thing, it's not out of bad behavior. He's not a bad kid. He's a good kid. He's agitated because of sensory overload. That's why he's agitated. He has, you know, he... He, he, he doesn't know his place yet, and so and he has autism. And this guy said, I'm sorry about your bad genes. It's not my fault. Just mm. get him out of here. Mm. And th at that point, I lost. I said, and then I, I, used, I had some choice words for him, and then I <laughs> confronted him, and I said, how dare you say this when no one's at fault? We don't know what causes autism. 
but we accept him for the way he is. And I said to him, how dare you discriminate my son just because of the way he was made by God? How dare you? And so you're right. I had to stick up for my son and stand up for him. Uh, I'm, I'm sure... I'm sure that everyone who is connected with autism sit, uh, sitting in, in, this, uh, in this room has had an experience like that. I, I know uh, it's, it's an incredibly frustrating thing. Um, I know uh, uh, I, I always say uh, it's an opportunity for a teaching moment, but obviously this guy uh, wasn't, wasn't there for teaching. He sounds like he was really there for booze. So uh, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe next time buy him a drink and say, I think you need this more than anyone. <laughs> so at, at the end, he did apologize and said, let me buy your meal for you. But I feel really bad about how I treated your son. So he, well, did, see? Okay. he did feel really bad about it. Okay, good. Because so, I was telling him that he's a kid. He's innocent. He did nothing wrong to you. So accept him for the way he is. Right. And so he was really sorry about what he said. And I think, I think, I think there's uh, – there's, uh, something implied in all of us when we're out with our children that uh, people should know that there's something going on, that they should understand that there's something going on. But a lot of people don't. And like, uh, I think, like my dad said earlier, um, autism is invisible. It's not a visible thing. There's nothing connecting you visually to it uh, in most cases. And, um, and so uh, I think you did the right thing. I, I, I think... Uh, you know, we just, we need, this is why we need awareness, right? This is why we need awareness. We need awareness because this kind of stuff happens, and we need awareness. We, we definitely need awareness. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about some, some, what I'm going to ask you right now, but what, you know, can each of you give me a, uh, maybe a challenge that you had to overcome? What were the challenges, well, maybe a challenge that you, that you were met with that you had to overcome and how you overcame it. So let's let's start with uh, let's start with you, Ryan. Okay. Um, so uh, not to be dramatic, but it's almost daily uh, that you do uh, have a challenge. But you know, some of the things with Jackson and being nonverbal is his inability to tell you what's wrong, what hurts, what's going on inside of him, and uh, that that is a struggle. So you, as a parent, need to guess. You need to start checking the boxes. You need to take a look at what this could be. Could it be a fever? Could it be a, a sore throat? Could it be an earache? And as many times as we take Jackson to the doctor, which is a lot, it's definitely one of those things that we still continue to do. Um, and again, it's you have to be patient with it. And God love my son for having autism and my impatience. I mean, I can barely spell the word patience and, and be happy with that. It's, he's very, he needs it. And you want that. And you had said it earlier that uh, you want it now. You want to fix this now. And you can't. And that's the struggle. And that struggle is real. That every day that you go through that, you, you want to know what his day was like, what he experienced. And then when he's mostly in pain and just most recently, um, you know, probably the largest thing that we had to overcome was elopement. We also, we know that kids elope and they have no sense of fear and Jackson went missing for 45 minutes. About tore my heart out. I was driving up 75, like a bat out of hell, excuse me. And uh, he was found, he was in a closet. Uh, fire department, police department were there, but, and, and then you get him out there and you try and understand what, what he was doing for those 45 minutes, you don't know. Will we ever know? Doubt it. But you know what? It's, it's overcoming that and, and trying to deal with that struggle and deal with the realization that he could just walk away and not have any care or thought about anything else. And you as a parent, you, you, you have to balance that. You have to balance the reality of that and do everything you can. And the other realization is that you're doing the best you can. You as parents, you as you know, grandparents, you as therapists, do the best you can. And at the end of the day, all you have is that moment when you look at your child and they're about to fall asleep and there's just this moment that is just so beautiful and it's just you and them and then they drift off to sleep and it's beautiful. And then guess what? The next day you got to get up and get after it. 
So that's what you got to keep doing. <laughs> Brian, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Steve. Wow, I can relate to a lot you said. Uh, our son is nonverbal too, and we waited for those first. You know, he had he had spoke a little bit. He was actually speaking in phrases, and his one of the things we saw is his speech started to arrest, and so we couldn't wait till he could say some words. And he has been able to say some words, but That's he great. hasn't hasn't been able to truly communicate. And and you know, you play the detective game, it's like you said. You know, you, okay, let's play twenty questions, and let's do the checklist and everything and try to figure out what's wrong. And what we found, our son is 17 now. And uh, you, you take that thing and you pour the, uh, a big dose of puberty right on top of all that. <laughs> and it's like, you know, let's, let's go to the campfire and get the can of gasoline and just pour it on the fire. And, you know, you wonder why I don't have any hair on my head or, or you know, my eyebrows are singed or whatever. You know, it's because of this, this fireball that's our son. And, uh, you know, the behavior things, uh, the eloping. We lost him in Gatlinburg one time. We lost him on our property for 45 minutes one time with a pond on it. When we found him, he was wet up to his chest, and he didn't swim at the time. So we, we I know that panic. Oh, man, that is, uh, you know, you just, you're just you're panicked and uh, but I have to share this just this hope because you know you do so many things and then finally you find something and we found something it's called rapid prompting method and some of y'all in here may know that and we were introduced to it back last fall and I just want to share one thing with you is hope because let me tell you our son is unbelievable I mean he did a lesson they did a lesson on Gandhi they it's a it's a teach ask thing and he was asked, he, he, the, the, the therapist read the questions, and he spells the answer out one letter at a time. And he sits for 50 minutes doing this, which is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And so they had a, they had a lesson on Gandhi. And part of the lesson, right at the end, they do a creative writing question. And here's the, here's the question. It says, create, the creative writing question, what are your thoughts on creating change? How do you believe it should be done? Now, this is a child that two years ago, the school system had him at, a, at about a first or second grade level. Here's his answer. I have typically held similar beliefs to Gandhi. I do not believe, I do not think violence is helpful to create useful change. And I was just floored. That sounds like a high school senior, maybe college. And this child has been pent up this whole time. And so it has created such hope in our lives because we've been able to crack into some of those things that we hadn't been able to crack into before. And it is absolutely amazing to us. So that, that, was, that communication piece, I agree with Ryan, that, that is a major hurdle because they're hurting. How do you yeah. know? What's wrong? Now I can draw it on there and write a little matrix and ask him to point to, because he can do that. He can't speak. He, he, he gave an answer one time, and part of the answer was, I want people to know how hard it is to be me who cannot speak. And I was just like floored. And he, he, he knows the answer. It's like a person that's had a stroke, and they yeah. know the answer, but... They're, they're not able to write it down because or, or speak because they can't get their brain to do it. Huge, huge frustration. Huge. Uh, David. Yeah, for me, uh, the hardest thing about dealing with my son is his extreme uh, pain tolerance level. I mean, ever since he was little, he would literally just hurt himself, bite himself, bleed, and yeah, my wife and I would just cry our t eyes out because we, we, we couldn't do anything about it. Even now, his pain tolerance level is so high to the point where if he gets frustrated, he would slam his hand against the, a glass window and not feel any pain. He would, be, he would bang his head on the wall and not feel any pain. If, he, if he's trying to fit you know, two pieces together, if it's not working his way, he would hit his head very hard, violently, because he's frustrated. He would not feel the pain. 
so as a father of a child on the spectrum, you know, I, you know, my heart goes out to my son because I don't want him to feel any physical pain, emotional pain. I'm supposed to protect him, you know, just because I don't live with him because they live uh, with his mother as part of the custody. Uh, you know, I, it's not a day where I still don't think about is he hurting himself? Is he, you know, is he frustrated? And so as a result, is he trying to? You know, you know, is he trying to do something to himself to soothe the the the, the frustration, which is pain? You know, he he's immune to pain. Uh, it's, a, it's really, you know, I I I I'm thinking about it all the time. So. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move on to something that that um, that you're going to enjoy talking about. You're really going to enjoy talking about this because I I want I want to know what the most rewarding aspect of, of having a child on the spectrum is for you guys. Um, and we're going to start with Steve. This is where it's dangerous. They ask for one thing. There's so <laughs> many things I would like to share. But, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll tell you one thing about elopement. He, we, we used to have, you know, the five-minute Jacob check. Everybody, if you hit, nobody's seen him in five minutes, we scan out and we go everywhere. And we were doing that. And I think he sort of knew this, okay? And so one time we had looked everywhere, everywhere for him. Could not find him. Went to his room. He had a bunch of stuffed animals. It was like a scene out of E.T. Literally, he had gotten in there and laid perfectly still. <laughs> and had all these around to where all, it was just this little bit of his face sort of poking through, and he's sitting there with a big sort of smile, grin on his face, like, you're not going to find me. I'm hiding right in plain sight. And, and I tell you, I could have killed him. You know? I says, you're causing me to have a heart attack, you know. But, <laughs> but I tell you, the one thing that Jacob's done for us that is just unbelievable, he has changed more people than we could ever change him. He, we call him our chief our CEO, we have a nonprofit foundation, Anchor of Hope Foundation, where we really truly believe there's hope for the future and joy in the journey because of Jacob, because he's our CEO, our chief encouragement officer, okay? And uh, doesn't mean there's not some times when he's, whoa, you know, but he really is, is, is fantastic. And, and through that, we have met people like you guys, my wife, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be up here without her. And I tell you, she is just fantastic. And, uh, but it, it's, it's, it's been so exciting to see what he has, he has spawned in helping us have the desire to start an organization that would be helpful to not only people with autism, but other disability. And so he's done that for us. And, uh, uh, now to see some of this communicating that's going on, and he's telling us uh, stuff through some of this uh, creative writing that he's doing. And it's been just really, really exciting to see that. That's been a great thing for us. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, David. You know, f for me, I, I, I am a CDC employee myself. I have undergraduate, master's, doctorate degrees. My son is my teacher. Despite of my degrees, despite of how, how far I have gone in my uh, education, even I wrote on Facebook, my son is still my greatest teacher that I can ever have. He taught me love, patience, compassion. You know, my son, a seven-year-old, I'm 43 years old. Nothing I ever went through in my education career ever compares to the learning I have received from my son. You know, he knows what love is, which is amazing. He might, you know, have other things going on in his brain, the way he's wired, but he knows something about love that is more than what I could ever really appreciate and learn about. Uh, he's made me a better person. You know, I used to be angry a lot of times, but he has taught me to soften up. A lot of times he would just reach out and hold my hand just to reach out to me. Um, you know, so he knows what love is, and... Uh, because of him, I'm a better person. That's a great answer, and I agree with you 100%. 100%. Thank you, David. Ryan. Uh, so I think Jackson's a force. Uh, he's 10. It's very simple with him. He either likes you or he doesn't. 
He knows what he wants um, and typically gets what he wants. So it, it, it's Jackson's ability to, and again, what Steve said, is really Jackson touches people in different ways. He has a lot of meaning. There's a lot of love there. And it's so simplistic, it's beautiful. Um, you know, we live in a very, everything's gray. You know, if Jackson could talk, I would imagine Jackson would be very matter of fact, which most kids with autism are. And I love that about him. Uh, I'm excited. I wish I was more like that. Um, I, I just, a- every day that, that Jackson tells me something or wants to do something, it, it's, he does it. He can communicate. He uses a device. Um, Jackson has grown. He's growing. He's 10. Puberty is right around the corner. Good Lord. Um, and it's going to be a challenge. But again, I feel that with him being able to find his voice with a device or a way to grab your hand and tell you what he wants, he can do it. But the proudest thing that I'd have to say, it's the little things that I don't really pay attention to anymore. It's, I, I'm, I'm his parent, I'm his dad, so I do things for him. I go get him water, I go get him food when he doesn't really need it. And when his therapists are there, and God love his therapists, but his therapists make him work for it, and boy does he get mad. But when he does, and he works for it, I, I'm in awe that Jackson can actually do this. He could, it's simple, he can fill his cup of water up. He could, we're starting to teach him how to make food. You know, put it in the microwave, push a button, and there you go. It's simple. But it's, it's amazing, and you sit back and you just watch this, and again, as, you're, as a parent, as someone that is responsible for your child, you do it for them, and I can't, and it's amazing. I have to take a step back and let him start to grow, and this is something that I'm learning, and I'm learning it now. It was just last week. I, I mean, I saw him do this, and I'm just, I'm floored. I'm like, wow, you can really do this. You know what? You're, you're bigger, better than me. I, I can't. I can't be, I can't keep doing this for you. I'm so proud of him every day. I'm proud of him when he gets in the pool, he gets out of the pool, he does other things. But again, there's so much more that he can do independently. And and I think that's what just makes me so happy. Thank you. Victories, victories. Okay. Um, Now I'd like you each to take a turn, a brief turn, and describe, or just, what would you like to tell the parents and grandparents who have children with, uh, with autism that are in the audience? Uh, is there, you know, what's the one thing, say one thing, that you would like them to know? Ryan, we'll start Okay, with you. yeah, sure. Um, hold on. It's, uh, this is a long journey. It's not easy. Um, but you definitely have others out there that will support you. Don't give up. You know, I feel like I was just about to quote Jimmy V. Sorry. Um, don't. Really, your child is unique, and you are going to be their voice. You are going to help them and look for others to help you. You know, keep digging. Find what their groove is. Find what makes them special. And, you know, and even if they don't have a voice like Jackson and they can't talk, be that voice. Be that advocate. You know, Jackson's lucky. I'm lucky that... His mother is who she is. Jackson wouldn't be here today without her. And again, you have to find that. You have to, you have to keep going, getting after it. You just cannot go down one avenue and then that's a dead end. Turn back, keep going. And unfortunately, like I said earlier, I don't have patience, but you, boy, do you have to with this. This is, this is tough and it is, it's lifelong. But I'll tell you what, at the end of the day, when you look at it and you look at your child and you know that they're, they're doing things that are making other people happy and they're making you happy and they're, they're trying and they're working. That's the most important. And again, they might not be an amazing politician, but you know what they are going to be? They're, they're your kid and they're going to just make you happy. Thank you. David. For me, the, the, the one advice I would give all of you is just know it's a long, hard, hard process, long journey. Uh, you know, even the therapist would say, let's just take him as far as he can go, just as far as he can go, whatever that means. Uh, 
and, you know, just, you know, look upon, you know, I don't know if you saw a picture of my son on, on the screen, Eric, but, you know, he's a precious kid to me, you know, he's my own flesh and blood, um, and, you know, you know, our legacy should be protecting these kids, you know, standing up for these kids, like I stood up to that guy at the restaurant who was poking fun at my son, thinking he's a brat or a really misbehaved kid who needs a good spanking. And so I realized from that point on, regardless of how old my son is, regardless of how old I get, when my son ages, I will always be there to protect him, no matter what. I will always be there. You know, I will even give up my life for my son, no matter what. I'll take a bullet for my son. I don't care. You know, my son comes first. There's my son up there. He comes first. Uh, you know, if you see my son, you know, he's smiling. You know, he has so much laughter and uh, happiness. We need to learn that happiness. You know, sometimes I, w- I wish I was like my son, you know, just to see the world differently. So let's see the world differently, like my son. You know. Steve. I was uh, practicing on the way up here with my wife, and when we got to this question, she says, Really? How are you going to do that? <laughs> on these things. So what I'm telling you is not what I have mastered. It's what I'm still working on, and I would encourage us all to do that because one of the things I think you, we, we sometimes feel, we feel very alone as, as a community sometimes, and we forget that there's so many people out there that are struggling with the same things we are, and we think we're the only one, and realize that you're not alone. You're not alone. I think that, I guess the title of that piece that they had up earlier that she played was I'm Not Alone. And so I think that was just beautiful. But, you know, you don't ask somebody that sometimes has an opportunity to preach to to give this advice. It's terrible. But anyway, I just say, number one, assume competence with your son or daughter that they are competent. They are intelligent. They are a human being. Number two, trust, uh, treat your son or daughter just like you would any other children. I was thinking, you know, we could be up here talking about any one of my children and answering these questions because every one of us has strengths and weaknesses, skill sets and, and talents and abilities. It's just we have such a diverse community within the autism spectrum. The third thing I would say is, uh, uh, you know, take care of yourself. My wife keeps telling me I need to take care of myself because uh, I need to, to be around for Jacob. And, uh, you know, to take care of yourself. The old thing, you know, when they get, you get on the airplane, you know, they give the safety talk, put the oxygen mask on first, you know, on yourself and then on your, your family members or friends or the guy next to you or whatever. But uh, anyway, you know, take care of yourself. And then uh, number four is uh, build a support team a- as you can. We found this out over the years of, of people that, uh, of family, of friends, of church, uh, folks, of teachers, of legal, financial folks that can surround your child as they grow old. And then the thing that we all want to li- do as parents of children with uh, autism or any kind of uh, disability is we want to just live one day longer than them. But we know that day may not come. So to build that team. And then, and then finally, you know, I, I, I say this, uh, you know, because I understand, you know, uh, how divorce uh, hits this group of folks. And my wife and I, I, I wonder sometimes, you know, how, how she puts up with me because I'm one of these guys that don't have a lot of patience and like, why can't you just obey? Why can't you just tell me you need ibuprofen? Come on, you know, here's the bottle. Point to it, do something. But, uh, you know, take care of your marriage and your spouse. It's so important, I think, because, uh, you know, I don't know how you guys do it that don't have, that are single. I mean, man, I, I just, whoa, you know, hey, y'all are, y'all are something else. But uh, to have a teammate and take care of that teammate, that spouse. So anyway, thank y'all again. I want to thank you for sharing your experiences uh, and being so honest. Uh, and uh, being so inspiring. And it's not, you know, it's not often you hear the perspective of a father. And um, it's so important to hear that. 
Uh, and so I'm, I, I'm glad that the CDC decided to make this kind of a father-themed event because it's, it's not often, you know, we as dads get thought of that much. And, um, you know, it, you're, you're right. It takes a team. It is a team. It's a team thing. And, uh, and uh, I applaud you all for being present in your child's life and taking such an active role and, and being as inspiring as you are. Thank you. 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 Thank you.